to be going back to our Sunday night series for the last time this year. We've been looking at this series, Besetting Sins, and we have covered some very weighty topics, at least weighty, regarding the sins that we're looking at in our society today. And so even though we're stopping this series this year, we're going to be revisiting it sometime next year. And so the topics, the sins that I did not get to, I'm keeping a list of those. We will be dealing with those, Lord willing, when we come back to this. Here's what I was thinking. Possibly on Sunday nights, looking at the beginning of this year, at helps we have in overcoming sin. Something very positive. Something that we all need to hear. Yes, there are besetting sins. But yes, we have help, ample, abundant help, to overcome temptation and sin. And so next Sunday, both Sunday morning and Sunday night, our attention is going to be focused upon Jesus the Christ. And I say that because please read Isaiah 53. That's where we're going to begin Sunday morning. If we conclude all of that context Sunday morning, we'll be turning our attention to something else regarding Jesus. But we want to look at Isaiah 53 next Sunday morning. And so please be reading those 12 verses. I think when you read it, you'll agree with me that that's one of the most amazing contexts in all the Bible. I believe the most beautiful regarding Christ in the Old Testament by far. But look at Isaiah 53, if you will. Besetting sins, what we've been looking at for the last few weeks, social drinking or drinking in moderation. Our sister Patty, Patty Reagan told me tonight, just a few moments ago, that she could sum up everything that we've said in the last four or five lessons with one verse. And when she told me the verse, I said, I do agree with you, Patty. First Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 21 and 22. Examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. You know what's unique about that latter phrase? Paul doesn't say abstain from evil. He says abstain from the very appearance of evil. The child of God should not have to prove that something is altogether downright evil before he or she abstains from it. If it has even the appearance of evil, then wisdom tells the child of God, let's avoid it. Let's depart from it. And certainly alcohol has the appearance of evil. We have cited problems that it has caused, calamities, troubles, tragedies. And if there's one that says alcohol doesn't have the appearance of evil, I wouldn't know what did have the appearance of evil. So we've been looking at social drinking or drinking in moderation. Now keep this in mind, we're not putting it on the screen. But we began by emphasizing what everyone agrees with, drunkenness is sin. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. We followed that by showing that wine, the word wine, is used generically in the Bible. Just because you see the word wine in the Bible, it doesn't tell you what kind of wine that is. Remember, we went to one book, the book of Isaiah to show the different usages in the Bible for that word, wine. In Isaiah 65 and verse 8, wine, the word wine is used to refer to the juice in the cluster. In Isaiah 16 and verse 10, wine is used to refer to the freshly squeezed grape juice. And in Isaiah the fifth chapter, verse 11 and verse 22, Wine, the same word is used to refer to the intoxicating beverage, the fermented drink. And so wine is a generic term. Keep that in mind tonight. Whenever you see the word wine, don't substitute our modern usage. Don't jump to the conclusion that it's always the intoxicating beverage, because biblically you cannot prove that. 
We also went to Proverbs 31, verses 1 through 9. King Lemuel's mother is not discussing social drinking. In fact, from Proverbs 31, you can build a case for abstinence long before you could ever build a case for moderation. We also looked at John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. Jesus turning the water into wine. And remember what we said. To me, it's critical. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, He was sinless. He lived and died under the Old Testament, never violated, never transgressed one Old Testament verse. With that in mind, the conclusion that must be drawn is that the wine Jesus made was freshly squeezed grape juice. Otherwise, he violated a host of verses and, of course, transgressed those verses. We looked last Sunday night at 1 Timothy 3 and verse 3 and also verse 8. The qualifications of elders not given to wine. The quali qualifications for deacons not given to much wine. And remember what we said. The condemnation of much does not encourage, it does not allow a little. Remember, we said both of those phrases, not given to wine, not addicted to wine. Again, the New American Standard Translation has it as that, not addicted to wine. You can't be addicted to little, you can't be addicted to much. And so those verses ought to be viewed as an apostolic prohibition against drinking, not an apostolic endorsement for social drinking. Well, tonight we're going to the last verse that we're considering. All of these verses are misused by those who want to encourage social drinking. This is the last one that we'll consider. When you look at Proverbs 31, John, the second chapter, 1 Timothy 3, verses 3 and verse 8, and 1 Timothy 5, you really have dealt with the major emphasis in the Bible, the major verses that people go to. Again, Paul writing to Timothy, notice what he instructs Timothy concerning. No longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Now once again, proponents of drinking in moderation come here, and of course their statement is, well, Paul told Timothy it was okay. He could drink wine. Well, notice this. Four needed observations. Let's just cite these observations. Think along these lines with me tonight. The first one, the wine Paul speaks of in this context is not defined or specified. Again, I will remind you what we've already said. Wine, biblically, is a generic word. It can mean the intoxicating beverage, but it can also mean the grape juice. And so the wine in this context, the wine spoken of by Paul, is not defined. It is not specified. Uh, you'd have as much trouble to say, I know that this is alcoholic wine, as someone else would have saying, I know just the opposite. Let's sort of consider both. You know, when you look at this, there is a great possibility that the wine here is referring to grape juice. Someone would say, if that's what Paul meant, why didn't he say it? Well, remember, the term wine is used to refer to the freshly squeezed juice. Uh, someone says, well, why would he have to write to Timothy about not, you know, drinking only water, but using a little bit of grape juice. You remember the Nazarite vow? In Israel, a man or a woman could place themselves under a special vow. And when they did this, that vow excluded everything that was grown on the grapevine, number six tells us, from the seed to the skin. Someone under the vow could not drink anything 
made from the vine, grape juice included. Some objections would be, well, this is the new covenant, and Timothy was not under the old covenant. Well, consider Acts 18 and verse 18. Before we jump to that conclusion, as long as someone did not bind this on someone else, they could take a special vow. Most commentators believe that's exactly what Paul did in Acts 18 and verse 18. Now some say they wonder if it's Apollos who's under the vow, but part of that Nazarite vow also was not cutting their hair. No razor touching their hair until the vow was completed. Well, you remember in that context, Paul had his hair cut in Syncria because he was under a vow. He had taken a vow. Many commentators believe that this was the vow that Paul was under, the Nazarite vow. And so what we need to remember, though, more than anything, is the wine that Paul speaks of in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23. It's not defined. It is not specified. But a second consideration from this context, Timothy must have been abstaining totally from drinking any wine. Have you ever thought about that? It's amazing to me that the proponents of social drinking go to various contexts and really, if you take the time to examine those contexts, they do not endorse social drinking. They teach just the opposite. They teach abstinence. But consider this. If Timothy was a drinker of wine, we wouldn't have 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23 in our Bibles. There would have been no reason for Paul to write to Timothy to tell him that he could take a little wine for his often infirmities, obviously, Timothy was a total abstainer. Remember what we said last week, what we even reiterated tonight at the beginning of this study. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 3, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 8. We should view that as an apostolic prohibition against drinking not given to wine, not given to much wine. Evidently, Timothy understood it as such because he was not drinking wine. And so Paul writes to him and tells him that once again, don't drink only water, but a little wine for your oft infirmities. There's something else to think about from this verse. Paul endorsed and allowed only a little wine. Again, this verse does not encourage what some people involve themselves in. It says a little, not a large amount. It says wine, it does not endorse the drinking of beer, the drinking of whiskey, the drinking of gin, the drinking of vodka. In fact, really, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23 only allows the child of God to drink only what Paul prescribed in that verse. And again, we're left in the quandary. Was it alcoholic? Was it fermented? Was it intoxicating? Or was it the pure juice of the grape? But the emphasis here, as the New King James captures it, is Timothy, don't drink only water. Don't drink exclusively water. Use a little wine, and once again, it was for his infirmities, for his stomach's sake. Read the verse with me again, and let's emphasize that. In 1 Timothy, the fifth chapter, notice something here. 1 Timothy 5, remember as we've said, the New King James captures the essence that Timothy should no longer be drinking water exclusively, only water. Look what Paul says in 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23. No longer drink water, uh, drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and your frequent infirmities. Now, notice something. Paul did not say, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your social gatherings. That's not what he said. 
He didn't say, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your upcoming events. Paul is not discussing social drinking here. Nor did he say, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your future parties. That's the way it would have to read if, in fact, this verse is allowing, sanctioning, endorsing social drinking. But that's not Paul's point at all here. Timothy was totally abstaining. Paul, because of his problems, because of his stomach sake, because of his infirmities, for medicinal purposes, says, Timothy, don't drink only water. But use, again, a little wine. Again, if it was wine exclusively, again, he doesn't say that, does he? Again, he's saying, you use a little wine, put that with the water. He's not saying quit drinking any water and just go to wine. So several things to consider here. Another thought in this verse, from this verse, Paul prescribed wine in view of Timothy's physical ailments and infirmities. You see, the medicinal application of wine here certainly does not endorse social drinking. And as we've emphasized in all of these contexts, Proverbs 31, John the second chapter, 1 Timothy 3, 1 Timothy 5, Social drinking is not even on the register. It's not on the radar. Again, for people to come to these verses and twist and distort them to act like this is what the inspired writer has in mind, it's not at all. This verse, 1 Timothy 5 and verse 23, has the force of a doctor's prescription. And that prescription was given to Timothy. It wasn't given to me, it wasn't given to you, but it was given to Timothy for a very obvious reason. Because of his stomach's sake. Because of his oft infirmities. And so again, 1 Timothy 5, in no shape or form, is even speaking concerning social drinking. But now let's do this as we conclude this entire series, and specifically social drinking or drinking in moderation. Let's go back in conclusion and just make some observations. Read these with me, if you will. After years of hearing and examining the arguments in favor of social drinking, I find the arguments begging and the scriptural proof to be lacking. I've heard probably every argument just as you have. But when you take time to go back to that same scripture, someone says this allows social drinking, this again endorses social drinking, you'll find out the argument's begging. There is no scriptural proof as they try to set it forth. Consider this, the arguments in favor of social drinking are at best shallow and at worst selfish. Here's what you'll hear not from serious Bible students, but from weak members of the Lord's Church, they'll say, well, you know, King Lemuel's mother, you know, she said something about drinking. And you know, Jesus turned water into wine. And Paul told deacons that they could drink. And Paul even told Timothy to drink some wine. That's the depth of the arguments that are being set forth in favor of social drinking. Shallow at best, selfish at worst. Some are bent on drinking. And as I stated a couple of weeks ago, if you're going to drink as a member of the Lord's church, please leave Jesus out of it. Please leave Paul and other inspired writers out of it. They're not endorsing your sinful habit. And so please just be more honest and say, I'm going to drink. I want to drink, and nothing can be said to deter me from following this worldly practice. At least have that kind of honesty. Notice something else. Liquor, alcohol, has many defenders, but no defense. Isn't it amazing? 
Abraham Lincoln years ago made that observation. Liquor, alcohol has many defenders, but no defense. We see it still today. Many defenders, but absolutely no defense, and certainly not when it comes to scriptural proof. Notice something else. Alcohol is a drug, a toxin, and a poison. Why on earth would we encourage social poisoning, social drugging? social intoxication. Do you see when it says a toxin? Think about this. Keep that in mind when you read about alcoholic intoxication. That's what it's talking about. It is a toxin. It's a poison. Someone has stated this. Alcohol is, in fact, treated by the human system not as a food, but as an intruder and as a poison. Dr. James Edmonds stated that. I love that observation. I have known that alcohol was a poison. But the way he phrased it, alcohol is received by the body as an intruder. That's exactly what it is. Why would we pour drugs into our system? Why would we pour a toxin into our system? Why would we self-poison? Again, it's an intruder. Dan and Catherine Cooper, we had this about three weeks ago. I want us to hear it again because this is so true and it's so simple. It's so basic. A Christian's attitude towards alcohol must be consistent with his attitude toward all other drugs. Parents, don't ever forget that alcohol is a drug. Do you take the same stance with other drugs that you take with alcohol? If you endorse social drinking, are you going to endorse the use socially, recreationally, of other drugs that are in our society? You see, we have to be consistent with the drug known as alcohol. Jim McGuigan stated, alcohol is an addictive drug. It is even more dangerous because it is socially acceptable and legally approved. Dr. Sidney Cohen, a drug abuse expert, describes alcohol as, quote, the most dangerous drug on earth. Dr. J.W. Beaumont, he said, alcoholic liquors are not nutritious, they are not a tonic, they are not beneficial in any sense of the word. Did you hear that? Not beneficial in any sense of the word. He's talking about nutritionally. But again, by extension, think about this spiritually. Not nutritious, beneficial whatsoever for the spiritual man. Read this with me. And I want you to pay attention to this one and the next quote. Because these two quotes, we didn't use them when we were talking about John, the second chapter, but I believe an application can be made concerning Jesus and the wine that he made from the water. But listen to this. God, by his direct act, does not make alcohol. The laws of nature, if left to themselves, do not produce alcohol. By these laws, the grapes ripen. If not eaten, they rot and are decomposed. The manufacture of alcohol is holy man's device. I put down this verse because remember what it says? I know it's not talking contextually about this subject, but the application is there. Solomon says, I found only this. God has made man upright, but man has sought out many devices. Even as we've just noted, one of the devices that man has sought out is the use of alcoholic drink. Notice this next quote. Alcohol is nowhere to be found in any product of nature, was never created by God, but is essentially an artificial thing prepared by man through the destructive process of fermentation. Dr. Henry Monroe made that observation. Regarding alcohol, the Bible makes a case for sobriety, temperance, and self-control but never for moderation. As we've suggested, none of the verses used to support 
social drinking really endorse that subject. They don't even touch the subject, but they don't endorse it whatsoever. God wants his man, his woman to be sober, to be temperate, to be self-controlled. As a Christian, do you honestly believe that drinking will not hurt or hinder your example and influence? Do you really believe that? Do you really buy in to that lie? That you can drink and by drinking is not going to hurt your influence, is not going to hurt your example. You see, we are taught by Jesus himself to be a city set upon a hill and a light set upon a hill. And we are to let our light shine that men might see our good works and thereby glorify our Father in heaven. Earlier in Matthew 5, we're the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its saltiness or its savor, it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under the foot of men. Do you see what Jesus teaches? Jesus says you're salt, but if you're not salt, if you've lost your saltiness, if you are no longer an example, have any influence, Jesus said you're good for nothing. Those are not my words, but Jesus Go back and look at Jeremiah, the 13th chapter. And God says the same thing about his people there. He tells Jeremiah to go buy a linen waistband. First of all, Jeremiah wears it. Then God says, you go take it now, hide it in the cleft of the Euphrates. Then he says, Jeremiah, go get that linen waistband. When Jeremiah goes back and get it, it is worthless. And you know what God says concerning that waistband? He compares that worthless waistband to his own children. And just like that waistband is worthless, he says, that's my children. They're worthless. When we lose our influence, when we lose our example, we've lost everything. We are worthless to the Lord's cause. We are worthless to a world lost and dying in sin. We can't pull them up when we're right there with them. Think about this. As a Christian, do you honestly believe that you can talk to someone effectively about Christ and His church with a drink in your hand? Now, I know social drinkers laugh at this. They laugh at this because they're not spiritually minded enough to talk to anybody about Christ and His church. And they would wonder why we even ask this. But that's the question that needs to be asked. As a Christian, do you really think that at a gathering with a drink in your hand, you can talk to someone about Christ? and about his blessed bride, the church of our Lord, and do so effectively? As a Christian, do you honestly believe that alcohol will help you become more spiritually minded? You read Galatians, the fifth chapter, beginning in verse 19, go through verse 23, and you'll find out that that whole context is setting in contrast the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And when you look at the works of the flesh, you know where drinking is? It's a part of the works of the flesh. It's not a part of the fruit of the Spirit. And so, again, do you really, do you honestly believe that alcohol will help you become more spiritually minded? Is it going to help you become more Christ-like? Again, do you honestly believe that drinking would be good for your marriage? How many marriages have been hurt have been injured, have been ended because of alcohol, the problems that it causes. Again, do you really honestly believe that alcohol would set a wonderful example for your children to follow and imitate? You know, if it's good for you, parents, you ought to endorse it to your children. Would you really, really want to do that? Turn with me to a passage in Matthew, the 18th chapter, our brother Matt McCullough, several times during this series, has told me that he believes one of the strongest arguments against social drinking is that about being a stumbling block. And it is. It's one of the strongest arguments. How do I know that when I put myself in that position that I'm not going to lead someone to become an alcoholic? to become a problem drinker, to put a stumbling block in the way of someone else. Listen to what Jesus says about stumbling blocks. Parents, apply this to your own life. If you're drinking, 
And don't mind your children to drink, to follow that example. Look at Matthew, the 18th chapter. And specifically, look at verses 6 and following. It says, But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. Then he goes on to show the severity, how soberly minded we should be, that if anything hinders us, get rid of it in our own life. If your eye causes problems, pluck it out. If your hand causes a problem, cut it off. Better to go into life lame than to go into hell whole. But do you see that about the stumbling block? Again, woe to the world because of offenses. But again, it would be better for a millstone to be hung around someone's neck and cast into the depth of the sea. Well, look at this one. Do you honestly believe that when Jesus returns, you wouldn't mind meeting him with a drink in your hand? And I'll go even farther. Those who misuse the context of John, the second chapter, those who indict the sinless nature of Jesus himself, would you mind meeting him with two drinks in your hand? One for yourself, the other one that you could offer him on that day of judgment. How absurd, how foolish indeed. Well, a couple of final statements. There's absolutely no intelligent criticism for complete abstinence. No law of God or man is violated by leaving alcohol alone. Did you hear that? There is absolutely no law of God that's violated when we leave alcohol alone. Notice, alcohol cannot rule and ruin your life if you do not drink it. We see the problems. We think, how can we avoid those problems? You know how. You know how. Don't be drinking alcoholic beverages. Do as Timothy. Be a total abstainer. Last but not least, no Christian ought to be an apologist for beverage alcohol. We concluded our lesson a couple of nights ago, or two Sunday nights ago, with this same observation. No Christian ought to be an apologist for beverage alcohol. How true that is. Why on earth would we ever defend this practice that has led to so much heartache, so many problems, so much sin? Why would we ever be on the side of that? Besetting sins. Brethren, we're all tempted. We all fall short of God's glory. Romans 3 and verse 23 is about as plain, as blunt as you can get. For all have sinned. We recognize that. But again, the wages of sin is death. What we need to do is when we sin, when we understand that we've transgressed God's law, we need to come to our Father. We need to confess that sin. The Bible tells us He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1 and verse 9. Every day, every hour, we have that privilege as a Christian to beseech our God, to confess sin, to repent of sin, to return to Him. Tonight, if a sin has ensnared you, and if it is of a public nature, then make that right publicly. Let your brethren know that you have repented of that. You've changed your mind, whatever the sin is, and that we're all going to do better. We're all going to strive to bring honor and glory to our Christ who died for us. Tonight, the lesson is yours. The series is yours. If you have any comments, if there's something we missed you want us to deal with later on when we resume these studies, please let me know. And by the way, the series is still open if you have a besetting sin that you want us to cover. Again, write it down, give it to me. When we resume it sometime next year, we'll make sure that we cover every one of your suggestions. Tonight, 
Is there a spiritual need in your life? Jesus can meet that need. Jesus can provide a remedy for sin. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, won't you come right now while we stand and while we sing?